Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. And a special welcome to Roz in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Today we shall discuss a book on the life and activities of a lawyer who became very well known for starting one important new project right after the other, one right after the other. His book is called Making Waves and Riding the Currents. The author is Charles Halpern, who is with me today to discuss his book. And I am Lawrence R. Valvel, the Dean of MSL. Thank you for coming. Charlie, I guess you started in California and you're going back to California, huh? Right. That's a long way. Well, it wasn't just for us. Uh, Charlie, uh, in the book, or let me put it this way, from the book it would seem, and I'm asking whether this is fair and maybe you could elaborate on it if it's fair, that your upbringing at home and your training at Harvard, which you don't talk about too much, but your training at Yale, which, at Yale Law School, which you do talk about quite a bit, uh, trained you, educated you in one particular way and in an incomplete way at that. And uh, you, you ultimately decided, uh, and we'll talk about it extensively, that a sort of half of the mental training one needs was missing. Why don't you describe the kind of intellectual training you got at home and uh, particularly at the Yale Law School, maybe to some extent at Harvard College? The training I got, Larry, was very much uh, uh, the training of uh, a lawyer. Think clearly, careful analysis, and uh, distrust emotions and distrust intuition. Really uh, a lawyer's mindset. And this, I got this from earliest growing up from my father who was uh, a lawyer and a law professor and a judge and who really uh, felt that that, was the, the, that that was the way a, a young person ought to be trained. That's the way I grew up at home. These skills were sharpened and honed at uh, uh, Yale Law School. And um, I, uh, I felt that it was an extremely useful kind of education, but incomplete. Yep. I really felt that there was, as I look back on it now, I, at the time I didn't have these thoughts, but as I look back on it now, I feel that uh, it would have been much, I would have been much better off if a little more attention had been given to emotional intelligence as well as the kind of IQ test uh, measure measures that uh, the test only the analytic skills and don't really get into the right. yeah. fuller range of uh, skills that a lawyer needs and that a person needs to be a full human being. So I had the feeling that uh, uh, these were some deficits that I had to fill in as I was uh, moving ahead. And it took me a long time to even realize that there, that there was something missing. But as I describe in the book, it gradually occurred to me that uh, the lawyer's skills were, uh, were not enough. And in fact, that this analytic training wasn't really sufficient to make me the most effective lawyer I could be. Even to be a, a full and effective lawyer, I needed to uh, be able to, to be a fuller person than just a, a, a very smart analytic machine. Yeah, you know, one of the great lines of the book is that is your line about your father, whom you said regarded his body as a carrying case for his brain. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely a priceless remark. Personally, I came from a different kind of a household. I, you know, maybe we met in the middle to some extent because it's not that there was no analysis in my house, but my parents were Russian Jewish uh, socialist oriented immigrants. So you can tell that emotion played a big role in everything that, uh, that went on. Um, why do you think your father became the way he was? He was himself first generation. Uh, his parents had come from uh, Europe, I would presume Germany, if this if the name is Halpern, uh, although I don't know that for a fact. Uh, and, and yet he turned into, uh, I guess, what could be described as an analytical machine. Why did this happen to your father in your judgment? Was this the price of success in America? My, my father actually came from, his family came from Eastern Europe. His, Eastern parents, Europe. his parents were uh, from Eastern Europe. And I believe that um, he, was, he was very good at this. He was, a, he was a very brilliant lawyer. He was a real lawyer's lawyer. Right, right. And um, partly it's this uh, uh, tendency to go with where our highest skills are. So right. he, was, uh, he was very well equipped in, in that sphere. Law was an excellent way for, uh, for uh, uh, 
the, uh, an excellent road out of poverty for yes, people yes. of that uh, yes. generation. And I think he had uh, uh, a real gift for this, uh, this way of being. And everything uh, rewarded him. He graduated from law school when he was 19. Mm -hmm. He uh, had to wait two years to take the bar exam. Mm -hmm. And then he began, as soon as he passed the bar exam, he began to teach at the University of Buffalo Law School, yeah. where he had yeah. uh, been a student. And uh, everything moved him in that direction. Right, right. In other words, one smart dude, and that's, so that's the way his life, uh, his li that's the channel his life took, you might say. That's right. And, and uh, the channel deepened as, as, yeah. as yeah. his yeah. career progressed yeah. and yeah. went from one achievement to another. Uh, it, it tended to yeah. be self-reinforcing. Understood, understood. Uh, do you think that the Yale Law School, with its uh, emphasis, as you say, on the, uh, on the uh, intellectual, on the argumentative, uh, on being uh, you know, verbally quick, uh, and I presume you must have done pretty well at the Yale Law School since you were a, a court of appeals clerk and you got hired by a premier Washington law firm. Do you think this affected, A, your view of yourself, B, your view of others, C, the way you thought a lawyer must act? Well, it's interesting. Uh, law school really does uh, uh, shape the kind of person we become. It's not just it's not just learning a set of skills, you know. It's right. it's learning to value a certain way of being in the world, and I do and I do think that uh, the legal education helped helped to reinforce what I had learned at home, and that is that uh, the analytic skills were the things that really were important, and. Uh, that I, I would ultimately be judged on how good I was at, at, with those qualities. And there was a lot that was left out. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, um, it, it, took, it took some years for me to yeah. identify those things that had to be yeah. filled in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Charles, that was fairly typical at the time uh, in the world that people like you and I lived in. And, uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, and I'd like you to describe this, y you came to believe that other things, uh, you could call it being centered, you could call it the practice of wisdom as you do, but it comes down to balance, to uh, listening to what other people say, to take account of what they say uh, rather than uh, immediately uh, become judgmental or immediately start arguing with them. About describe it more fully, what you think is the other side of this coin here and how you came to it and why you think it made you a better person and a better lawyer? I would start the, uh, that uh, process uh, while I was still in, in law school. When I uh, uh, had my first children, oddly enough, that gave me some insight into what the other set of qualities were all about. Uh, these were these were little beings who were not going to be rational and who were not going to listen to argument, and I had to engage with them, and I enjoyed engaging with them at the mo in in the most primitive and playful ways. What's a way to in include what's primitive and playful in my life? I thought, and how do I? Is there something there that I'm learning from being a parent, from being a father, that would actually be helpful to me? as I was trying to uh, design a career and to build a career. Then I, um, I realized when I was in a private corporate law firm in Washington, D.C., that uh, some of the people who were senior partners and hugely successful in the profession were not people that I admired or wanted to be like. And what I identified was their, uh, the shortcomings of their career that that were in part, the way they had to be to be so successful in their career made them much less successful in other parts of their lives. Right, right, right. First, it took too much time to be that successful a lawyer, but also there are qualities of empathy and kindness and a capacity to listen and a capacity to, um, to, be, to, to be respectful of other people's uh, demands. Those people lacked a lot of those skills. Some of these skills have come to be called emotional intelligence. Yes, yes. And I believe that emotional intelligence is an extremely important quality for a lawyer. A lawyer who meets a new client, a potential client for the first time, has to be able to present herself or himself in a way that lets the client know that this is someone that the client can trust. 
Just saying, trust me, doesn't do the job. It's got to be somebody who, by his presence, shows the person he's speaking to that he really is accessible and available and is an effective listener. The skills at listening, which are so important for lawyers, are not normally cultivated in legal education. And what's true of lawyers is true of many professions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are statistics that show how frequently doctors interrupt their patients yeah, when the yeah, patients are yeah. trying to describe what their conditions yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. And that capacity to listen is something which is undervalued in, the, in many educational yeah. systems and in systems of professional training. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a lot being written these days about doctors uh, not listening to their patients and therefore uh, 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 missing a great deal. Jerome Bootman's book is, uh, is, is in part, major part, uh, about that kind of a thing. Why did, uh, you were at uh, Arnold, uh, when you started it was called Arnold Fortis and Porter. Fortis quickly went to the Supreme Court, so it became Arnold and Porter, which is how it's known today. W why did you go to that law firm and what was your reactions You've described your reaction to some of the senior partners. Whatever you, say, you, you may have said about them, you know, we, we both know this is true in space throughout Washington, New York, and every big city and every big law firm. Uh, but what is it that you liked about the firm and the people? What is it that you didn't like about the firm and the people? Uh, and and uh, explain your, uh, a little bit about uh, your uh, experience in the Rouse case, which had a major impact on you. Well, I went to that firm uh, in Washington in part because it had a reputation of, of being willing to take on difficult cases and politically challenging cases, and had a real commitment to building social justice. For example, they were one of the few firms in Washington, D.C. during the McCarthy era that was willing to take cases on behalf of people who were charged with right. Communist Party membership. And they were courageous and effective in representing those people. I thought that sounded uh, attractive to me. The people were uh, 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 tended to be uh, humorous and uh, uh, attractive, and and uh, it just seemed like a lively and interesting place to work. It was in those days a very small firm. I was the thirtieth lawyer yeah. to work there. Now in they in a townhouse. In a townhouse, a beautiful Neat. townhouse, yeah. and uh, uh, now they hire thirty people a year. Yeah. But at that time, it meant that it was a very intimate place to work, and I was very uh, drawn to that. And I thought they'd give me a lot of time to work on pro bono matters, that is, matters which aren't really on behalf of paying clients, but really are uh, things that I cared about. And it, it, did, it did give me some of those opportunities. Um, uh, the Rouse case that you mentioned was perhaps my most important uh, public interest case that I handled in, in that firm. It involved a man who had been uh, confined to a mental hospital, a public mental hospital, in Washington, D.C. for four and a half years after he was charged with a, a relatively minor crime. And he wasn't getting any treatment. And I uh, handled the case in which we raised the claim that he had a constitutional right to receive adequate treatment if he was going to be uh, confined because of his mental illness. And it was a very important case. And uh, uh, it was a turning point for me because I, uh, I learned two things from that case. One was that it really is important it is important and possible and realistic to uh, try to work for a more just society by using the law and using the courts that was an important thing for me to really experience and the other thing was to to experience the pleasure of helping a person who was really suffering and was suffering from a lot of uh, uh, injustices that I thought I could help him escape from and that personal connection I made was something that was also uh, extremely helpful to me. When I, saw, when I uh, successfully got his release in that case, I thought, well, now, I'd, I'd really like to explore the principles that we were, principles of law we were dealing with, see if we could get other mentally ill people who aren't receiving treatment, or people who are being held uh, against their will with no treatment whatsoever, uh, whether we could get them released, whether we could try to get state systems to work right, more effectively. Right, right, right. So I was uh, full of enthusiasm for these possibilities and excited by what looked to me like a very interesting field of law to develop. But of course when I ba went back to the law firm, they were much less interested in that kind of thing than yeah. having me go back to work on antitrust cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really a turning point for me. It made me look back at my 
legal education to reassess what I wanted to be a lawyer for and to think about whether there isn't a way to uh, yeah. use my skills yeah. in a way that yeah. really would help yeah. to build a better world. Well, that's the next thing you did in life, but, and I'm going to ask you about that in one minute, but one of the, mo uh, what, one of the fascinating uh, comments in the book, it was the comment of this fellow Rouse who had committed a crime for which I guess he could have been put in jail for a year, and here he was in his fourth year of confinement with no treatment, and he apparently uh, was aware of the interplay uh, between the prosecutor, the defense lawyers, the judge, and you bring in the appellate judge, all of whom were playing certain roles or had certain personas, and this fellow finally uh, looked at you and said, why am I, you know, he said this, that, and the other about the, he said, why am I the one who's, who's regarded as crazy here? Well, <laughs> well he describe some of that. Well, Rouse, Rouse was a very, he was, he was a young man, a few years younger than I was at the time, and he looked around the courtroom and he said, everybody is, everybody is playing some kind of manipulative game. The prosecutor wants to be known as a tough-minded prosecutor. Uh, the judge here wants to show that he's not going to take any nonsense from a court of appeals. You're here because you A guy you named Bazelot. I, the court of appeals judge was the chief judge named David Bazelot. That's uh, right. That name will no, be known to some older people. Right. A very important person in developing the field of uh, law and mental health and mental illness. Uh, he, so, so Rouse looked around the courtroom and he said, everybody's playing a manipulative game. You're trying to establish yourself as a, as a young, cause-oriented lawyer. And, but, uh, but why, it, with all of you playing these different roles and different uh, games, why am I the one who's singled out and, and sent to a mental hospital yeah. because I'm yeah. mentally ill? Yeah. I just want to get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was a, a, a telling moment for me. Because um, from his perspective, this was uh, uh, a lot of a lot of game playing, and people who weren't really concerned with his best interest. And um, he felt that he was unfairly singled out, and I, in a certain sense, felt he was too. And that was why I was so anxious yeah. to see yeah. him re yeah. receive his liberty back. It, it's not precisely uh, apropos. But it did remind me of uh, mental hospitals in the Soviet Union under communism. If they didn't like your views, they sent you there and they said you were crazy. And it seemed to me to have a, a certain resonance with that. And ultimately, you got him out of jail, or out, out of the uh, mental institution. But this is so typical of law, not, on the cl not for the fundamental uh, ideas or principles that were involved in the case, but on what some people might think of as the technicalities, I remember. Well. Uh, yes, it, it was not because he was receiving inadequate treatment, although I'm persuaded that that was yeah. a sufficient reason to release him. But they had, they, they did make the case turn on, on some technical deficiencies in his original uh, commitment, which was disappointing to me because I thought that the right to treatment principle was one that really ought to be s clearly articulated. Later in my career, after I left private practice and was able to pursue this, I was able to establish that that was a constitutional right to receive yes. adequate treatment if you're yeah. going to be confined. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you say that this was a turning point, and um, I, I got the impression from the book and also from something you said here a minute ago that uh, it somehow awakened in you uh, a passion for social justice, if I may put it that way. Where did that come from? One of the things in the, in the household I grew up in, one of the, one of the virtues besides this analytic uh, brilliance that I've described to you, that my father carried was a real commitment to social justice. He felt that that was the lawyer's job, was to build a more just society. And he felt it extremely important that lawyers provide representation and uh, effective counsel for people who were suffering from un, uh, fundamental unfairness from government or other institutions. So I would say that that was the main source of my uh, 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 commitment. Then in addition, uh, right after law school, I went to uh, Louisiana in the summer of 1965. Yeah. And for a short month, I was a civil rights lawyer in northern Louisiana. And I had a firsthand exposure to the injustices suffered by the uh, 
black population of the Deep South. I could see where the paved street ends and the dirt road begins, just where the black neighborhood, the segregated black neighborhoods begin. I could see by just walking past them on the street how inadequate the black schools were when you compared them to the white schools. This was a decade after the Supreme Court held school segregation unconstitutional. And the uh, residents of northern Louisiana clearly uh, were suffering from unequal treatment, the black residents. Yeah, of, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, that brief exposure, I went down there to try to uh, provide representation right, to right. these people in, in the burgeoning civil rights movement. But I didn't do much good for them, a little perhaps, but it did a lot of good for me because I really had the sense that this was a role that I could play and that this was work that was worth yeah. doing. Yeah. So when I came north, I had that, that seed had been planted and it was germinating for me. And then when the Rouse case came along, I could see it, was, it, it didn't involve racial segregation or racial discrimination, but it was a minority population that was being treated abusively yeah. and that had legal rights that could be vindicated. And it seemed to me that that was where I wanted to direct my efforts as a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, I've often wondered why it's not Du Bois, but it's Du Bois, uh, what, uh, wrote some very famous stuff uh, about the double consciousness of uh, Amer uh, African Americans in the United States. And I had a sense from your book, and, and indeed I think this was reasonably well known around Washington when I was there at about the same time you were, that there was a strong sense of double conscious, uh, consciousness uh, in, Arl in Arnold and Porter because of the nature of the lawyers. They were working on behalf of, let's say, tobacco on the one day, and they're working uh, pro bono for social justice on another day. And people had to kind of keep both of these things in their head, and it, it kind of created a, a mixed mentality, didn't it? Well, it was hard for me to understand that, and I, I decided I didn't, want to, I didn't want to have that kind of split. I wanted to be able to do work that I uh, felt important and that I was really committed to all the time. And, I th and that's, one of the, that's one of the reasons why I was prepared to leave what in many ways was a very comfortable and attractive place yeah. to work. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I didn't want to have that kind of split. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't like, I, I tr anticipated that if I lived with that kind of split, it, would, it, it wasn't going to be good for my growth as a human being. I didn't, I didn't want to be somebody who, uh, who wasn't proud of all the work I did. Uh, I would have to say that you walked away from a firm which, these things are always questionable, but uh, by and large, I think Arnold and Porter was regarded as probably the best law firm in Washington, D.C. to work for in those days. I don't know what it's like today. And so, uh, you know, you had the courage or desire or whatever it took to walk away from, from a firm like that. Now, when you walked away from it, you started the... Uh, Center for Law and uh, Social Policy. Uh, you and a fellow named Bruce Terrace and a fellow named Mormon and Cowan. When I was in the Department of Justice, I used to hear Terrace's name all the time, although I've never met him because he was in the Solicitor General's office for a while. But tell the process of how you four guys got, came together, the debate you had, and how you managed to start what was the country's first, as I understand it, public interest law firm. Well, maybe one would say the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP might have been that. But other than that, that uh, you were the first, I think. Well, the, we started thinking that, in part based on my experience with the Rouse case and my time in Louisiana, a small group of us got together and started to think, well, how could we organize a kind of law practice that provided the kind of sophisticated legal representation that Arnold and Porter provided to ordinary people and on causes where... Uh, there, was, there was no corporation around to pay exorbitant fees to a, a law firm. We thought that the quality of justice uh, would probably be improved if that kind of legal representation was available, say, on mental health cases or on environmental cases. This is a time when the environmental movement was starting to wake up, but nobody was thinking about how the courts could be used to protect the uh, environment how administrative agencies could be used to protect the environment. So we talked about this over a period of time. We talked about how we could fund this. We thought we'd try to raise some 
grants from private foundations, charitable foundations. And we developed the idea of a Center for Law and Social Policy, a public interest law firm funded by foundations that would provide representation for the unrepresented. Environment became one of our first interests. And um, uh, in our first year of operations, we uh, got an injunction against the construction of the Alaska Pipeline requiring them to go back and replan the pipeline so that they would take into account the environmental hazards that were presented. Uh, and we got also an order that led to the uh, removal of DDT from domestic markets at a time when the indiscriminate use of DDT was leading to disastrous environmental consequences in the United States. And then we, uh, we started a, a series of uh, mental health cases which really uh, nailed down the fact that people in mental hospitals or institutions for mentally retarded people have the same kind of constitutional rights that every other citizen does, that the Constitution doesn't exclude mental hospitals from its protections. So these were very uh, heady and ex ex exciting cases for us. As we started to win some cases, we started to draw money in. As we started to draw money in, we were able to build a board of trustees that gave us um, that made us look larger and more respectable than we were. We were pretty young people at that time. Right. In right. a profession, I was 29 when yep. I started yep. this. And uh, ours is a profession which values um, many more years of experience. So we had to, we had to make ourselves look uh, more, perhaps more grounded than we actually were. Yes, well, you and I look that way now. <laughs> <laughs> we may not be grounded, but we look like we, we are. We look like it. That's yeah. right. Very, very important. We had the good fortune of, of drawing uh, Justice Arthur Goldberg, who had resigned from uh, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, into our project, and he became chairman of our board. Well, at that point, we looked like a much more right. uh, respectable institution, right, right. and uh, uh, that enabled us to, to get this work flowing. And then a number of other public interest law firms developed a network around the country to some degree that handled environmental cases, civil rights cases, mental health cases. Yeah, you had a lot of spin-offs. Yes. Spin-offs and emulators. Yes, wonderful. Um, in getting, I think it was in connection with getting Goldberg, and if not, it was in connection with getting somebody else who was a very big name. You talked about the ex-cabinet officer syndrome, also called the great man syndrome. Elaborate that, if you would. Well, I was, uh, I was quite surprised when I was uh, 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 a young public interest lawyer how easy it was to get people who had held very high positions in the government to answer my phone calls and ultimately to, to join in our project as members of our board of trustees. And um, I realized that there is this uh, uh, period of um, anxiety and isolation after people leave a position like Secretary of Labor or Attorney General when they no longer have uh, cars and drivers uh, driving them around the downtown Washington. They have to take cabs like everybody else. And their phones don't ring so much. Yeah, yeah. And I found, I called that the ex-great man syndrome. And I, you know, my, it, it affected my own ambition to occupy those high positions because I realized that you occupy those high positions and then you don't anymore. Yeah. And you are, uh, uh, and, and your phone stops ringing. And, um, it, what it made me think about is how do I find satisfactions that aren't dependent on the position I hold or the important people who are looking to me for advice, but something that, that something in myself that uh, gives me those satisfactions, because that's going to be more durable, and I'm not going to find myself someday being the ex-great man waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah. I think that's one of the most, maybe the most important lesson somebody could know. Uh, somebody can learn. Uh, it's also called things such as a, a, a self, when you can uh, self-reliance, uh, internal self-reliance. I don't think Bill Clinton's ever learned it. I doubt that he ever will learn it. Uh, you know, <laughs> other direct, <laughs> it's being inner directed as opposed to being outer directed or other directed, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very, uh, very vital for a happy life, I think. Now, you, you, uh, the people who started the Center for Law and Social Policy. Uh, all uh, very accomplished people, all very uh, became in their own fields very eminent people. 
and all, including yourself, left CLASP, it was called CLASP by the acronym, within what, five or six years. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that happened? I think the main reason is that the, the initial group uh, had developed skills and uh, a track record, a record of accomplishment that made them very attractive to other people who wanted to set up similar organizations. So, for example, Jim Moorman, one of our founding lawyers who had been the lead counsel in these environmental cases, uh, was uh, snapped up by the Sierra Club, which wanted to start its own internal right. law firm, which they called at first the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, now renamed and in, spun off as Earth Justice. Um, and uh, Jeff Cowan went out to California where he began a public interest law career there, uh, working in Los Angeles with a public interest law firm, ultimately became uh, dean of the Annenberg School at USC. Um, so th there were opportunities. Uh, uh, Vic Kramer, one of our earliest lawyers, went off to start a uh, uh, group called the Institute for Public Representation, a public interest law firm at Georgetown Law School. So there were opportunities uh, to, to take on these uh, other positions. I left to become uh, head of a new organization called the Council for Public Interest Law. So each of us, I think, were drawn away by other things. Yeah. And fortunately, the Center for Law and Social Policy has been able to renew itself, bringing in very talented uh, people to exercise leadership. And it's now uh, uh, entering its 40th year of activities. Yeah. Yeah. Kramer was a fascinating guy because he was the hiring partner when you were applying at Harlem Porter, and he epitomized a hard-bitten, you know, in-your-face and uh, guy. He hires you at, a at the time of what, maybe a 26 or 7-year-old kid, and he's about 55 at the time. A couple of years later, he's knocking on your door. He wants to go to work for your public interest law firm. Yeah, it was a w it was a wonderful thing. He was yeah. a, a wonderful person, uh, and a legendary antitrust lawyer. A celebrated antitrust lawyer, and when he was when he first hired me, he said, "Do you really want to work in this law firm? You seem to be somebody who's got a real, a real yen for serving the public. Why do you want to come here?" And he really put me through. Uh, I had to persuade him that I should, that I wanted to work there. Right, right. And so it was really important when he turned around five years later, no, yeah. uh, ten years later, yeah. and said, "I want to come here, work in this public interest law yeah. firm." Yeah. That made me, and it, it gave us a lot of credibility in our firm, oh and yeah. it made me feel like I had done something right. Yes. That I made me feel very good about the judgment I had made. Wh he was a great lawyer, Kramer, a wonderful person. Yeah, well, he was, I used to hear about him in, when I was in the Department of Justice. I hear his name all the time. Wh why do you think, I, I think it's true that in the conservative public interest firms that followed you 10 and 15 years later, people there have stayed there if, I mean, that they have, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, editorial page of the New York Times, they have these paid-for ad editorials all the time. I've seen the same names for 10 and 15 and 20 years. Why have they stayed where they are, whereas you, you folks, because they're obviously competent people too, why have they stayed where they are, whereas you folks moved off into other areas, in your opinion? Well, some of them have stayed where they were, and, uh, and s some... I, I think it, it's a mixed story on both sides, on, on the progressive and the conservative law firms. I mean, take somebody like uh, James Watt, who was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of you the Interior. You take James Watt. <laughs> <laughs> well, he came out of a conservative public interest law firm called the Rocky Mountain yeah. Law Firm. So some people use that as a way station, and then some people have, uh, have held, had long careers. But that's also, that's also true. Uh, uh, among uh, uh, progressive public interest firms. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Al Bronstein, who was one of my heroes when he was a civil rights lawyer in Mississippi, did that work for a couple of decades and then led the National Prison Project for a couple of decades and became a really important influence and a real mentor for many people, myself included. And uh, so it's a, it, it's a mixed story. Um, my own my own career was blessed in many ways by opportunities to, to start one thing after another and to, and to keep moving, and that suited me well. Yeah. Now, one of the next things you did uh, was to uh, start the CUNY Law School. 
But in the process uh, of your work, and I guess it was about the time that you started, maybe you were a class at the time, you met a, a, a Chinese American, an American of Chinese ancestry physicist named Ralph Xu. Did I pronounce it right? Xu, Xu, okay. Uh, and he, uh, he, he was very important uh, to you in explaining to you the other side of what you needed to learn other than the intellectual side. And he also, I think of it as he, he taught you to go with the flow a little bit. And he also taught you about a concept which he called, and you in your book call, Chinese baseball. Now maybe you can explain what this go with the flow business meant and what Chinese baseball meant. Good. Ra Ralph Xu was a uh, really brilliant research chemist, and he managed huge research budgets in, in uh, the sciences. And he always had a hobby throughout his adult life of trying to integrate Eastern thought and Western thought and try to, try to bring together the best of both. It's a fascinating figure, grew up in extreme poverty in Hawaii where his parents had been imported from China to uh, uh, work as laborers in the, in the uh, cane fields of, sure. of Hawaii. So he had, he had made quite a transition. And um, he brought, he, my association with him started informally, we were both serving on a nonprofit board together. And I gradually realized, as we started to meet for lunch together, that he was becoming a teacher of mine. And that just largely by the questions he asked me, he got me to widen the lens I was looking at the world through and to see my analytic work as a lawyer in a much larger context, in a much larger framework, to see the full range of human possibility in the world. And that um, breadth of vision uh, was something which was, as I started to pick it up from him, it was extremely important to me. This is where I first got the idea of wisdom, that the practice of wisdom might give us a larger sense of things which would make us not only happier and fuller people, but would make us uh, more effective in the world. Well, could that be described as seeing the big picture to some extent? That's a, a, a big piece of it. And also, so, so, for example, in seeing the big picture, that's a, you could be less impatient with things. You might see a situation of injustice at the present time, but you know, maybe this is an injustice which will resolve itself on its own in a few years, and, it does, and you don't have to turn it into a contentious subject right now by pushing for an immediate shift in practices. So that was, that was what you might call seeing the big picture. Another element of seeing the big picture was to understand the impermanence of everything. That if you won a victory today, that may be a very significant achievement, but it may not, it, it may not last more than five years or ten years. I mean, in the long run, we're all dead. Well, and, and now in this, in, in this century, in the 21st century, we're confronted with all kinds of problems like global climate disruption where we're not going to see outcomes for, for tens of years, ten or hundreds of years. And we all have to work for um, environmentally protective outcomes which our children and grandchildren will have to assess. So that, the, that's the big picture that you, that you speak of. Now he also, he also used the term Chinese baseball. And uh, that was important for me. He, he uh, asked me one day over lunch whether I knew what Chinese baseball was. I said, no, I'd never heard the term. <laughs> and he said, well, Chinese baseball is exactly the same as American baseball, but with one difference. Whenever the ball is in the air, any player on the field can move any base. <laughs> so... <laughs> So you can, you, you know, in, in a way that's like describing chaos. Yeah. He well, you said, can't get to first. <laughs> he said that you don't know where first base is going to be by yeah. the time yeah. you've run down the... Yeah. So he, uh, he suggested this not just as a kind of a whimsical idea, but also as a way of thinking about the world. This was a kind of metaphor. And he said that many of the things that, that uh, 
uh, many of our most important and interesting challenges can be conceived of as a kind of Chinese baseball. And that I should be prepared for things to change rapidly and radically. And that I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't be so fixated on particular outcomes, to thinking that if I, then there's some kind of linear connection between my effort here and a certain outcome there. Yeah. I could make the best effort I could. And because it is Chinese baseball, not American baseball, you know, I, I don't know whether the outcome would be what I would hope for. It might be something quite yeah. different. It, it has a lot to do, doesn't it, uh, with the fact that people are always, the people you're dealing with or are opposing, uh, are always changing their views. They're always bringing up new problems. I mean, that's a part of it, isn't it? It's kind of like Kissinger, uh, who, of course, deserved the, the, no the Nobel Peace Prize, we all know, uh, said talking about laid up toe and say, God, you think you've pinned it down 10 times and they change it 11th. I mean, that's a part of it, isn't it? It's, people are always changing their minds. And there's, it's not just people changing their minds. We don't have control over the physical environment. Yeah. You know, we don't yeah. know, we don't know whether uh, uh, a, a day that starts sunny is going to end sunny or whether, uh, well, you know, I, I'm thinking at, at the moment of the, the tragedy in Burma where yeah. Uh, yeah. unpredictable circumstances uh, change, the, change the reality for hundreds of thousands of people. So w Chinese baseball is, uh, is a very good way for us to be thinking about the complexities and unpredictabilities of our world and our social relationships. L let me ask you a question, Charlie, that comes straight out of uh, Western thought uh, in this regard. Uh, businessmen will tell you, uh, you know, I'm the dean of a law school. Uh, it's a freestanding, it's an independent school. That is a lot like running a business. Businessmen will tell you, I mean, in part, it is running a business. Businessmen will tell you that it's not so important as to what the rule is, but that there be a rule so that they can have some certainty uh, in, in what they're doing. People will say about developments in the third world that one of the reasons the third world doesn't develop is because the rules of the game get changed on people in the middle. Uh, you know, in Russia, you may own a factory today and tomorrow you're in jail. Uh, and the guy who in the government owns it until he gets thrown in jail. These kinds of things. Now, personally, I tend to think that there's no progress unless there are rules that you, so because that enables you to, to know what you'd better do in order to meet whatever rule you have to meet. Now, maybe you disagree with that or maybe you integrate that with what uh, uh, Ralph Shue said. I think that uh, that we do need rules and that in order to build a just society we need just rules and that our, our role uh, and responsibility is to work for just rules. And I think that that truth has to be encompassed within a larger truth which is uh, that our rules have a limited impact. We can make all the rules we want about uh, about our health, our life, our death, the weather, natural catastrophes, automobile accidents. Those are not things which, uh, which are responsive to rules. And for us to be wise lawyers or wise people trying to navigate a complicated world, we're well off to understand that rules are important, but they're not the only thing in the world, that they exist within a very much larger framework which we can only barely understand. Right, right. I think that that understanding of the importance of rules and, and the world beyond the rules and, there, and try to keep those things in balance and try to keep a, some relationship, that's the, that is the practice of wisdom and that's where I think we have to be going. That is in a way, I would say, a metaphysical concept but you might disagree with that. Uh, and that's not a pejorative statement. I'm just making, I think, a descriptive statement. To me, it's a, it's a metaphysical concept. Uh, but in order to uh, achieve this balance, you have, during the course of your life, uh, meditated extensively and still do, uh, done yoga, uh, gone on the incredible winter retreats in the coldest part of the winter in the Adirondacks, uh, uh, done other physical things that are very, very testing, canoeing, uh, Explain the importance of these kinds of activities to you in your life generally and in your profession. 
Let me let me uh, return uh, to the question you asked earlier about uh, my shift into the City University of New York Law School. Yeah. Because it's here that I really found myself playing Chinese baseball and feeling very much over my head. Uh -huh. I, I was dealing with a complicated political situation, with an academic bureaucracy that wasn't so sympathetic, with a student body and a faculty that was hard. I was, I was being buffeted from all sides. And it was at that point I actually turned to two of my wise counselors. One was Ralph Sue, we've talked about. The other was a, a Jesuit priest named Timothy Healy, who was then the president of Georgetown University. Very famous guy. Wonderful, a, yeah. one, a, a justly famous person. Wonderful person. And I was really feeling over my head intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. And they both encouraged me to do this kind of inward work that you're describing, uh, to really try to develop the inner resources so that I could remain balanced, to maintain the vision I held of this law school as being a place uh, devoted to the public interest, where we would be educating students to be full people, to practice law from their hearts as well as from their heads. That was our goal. And I had to hold on to that in the face of some fairly extreme challenges from a very complicated uh, environment. It's in this context that Ralph Sue spoke to me about uh, Chinese baseball. And um, I came to realize that I was going to have to cultivate some inner resources, some inner capacity to stay balanced and grounded in order to continue for, to move ahead through these challenging circumstances. Can I interject something? I mean, I in a certain sense, what you just said is, quote, only common sense because you could go crazy otherwise, couldn't you? I mean, not just you, anybody could. I think so. I yeah. think so. And uh, uh, in, a, in a way, it is common sense, but, uh, but it's rather uncommon these days. Right. Well, that's the most the interesting thing about common sense. It's always very rare. <laughs> <laughs> well, that particular common sense is really rare at this moment. We're under so much pressure to do more, to work harder, to multitask. And these, I don't think it's possible to stay centered and to stay balanced if you're constantly bombarded by media messages, by uh, efforts to do more, to work longer, work harder. Because I think there's got to be a kind of a balance. The, b the title of my book is Making Waves and Riding the Currents. Making Waves is about the public interest law work, setting up a new law school, challenging the construction of the Alaska Pipeline. That's the making waves. Riding the currents is the part about settling back and trying to be, to really understand what's going on in our world and to respond to it in a way that brings out our deepest wisdom. To do that, I think we've got to balance our activism with this kind of inward, reflective time and work. For me, it's taken the form of meditation and time in nature. It's been extremely healing to me uh, to just take a long walk on a snowy day or on a beautiful spring day like today in Massachusetts. And, um, and to just let, let myself be nourished by that time, to clear thoughts out of my mind, and just to relax with that. And often, if I go on a long walk uh, with, a, with a, a really naughty problem that I can't find the solution to, when I come back from my walk and sit down at my desk, I'll have the solution. Right. It just arises. I didn't think of it. It just arose for me. And a lot of people say it happens overnight after they sleep. I think that's very common. Yeah. And I know you used to go out to West Virginia, which uh, resonated with me because you used to go to the uh, Valley of the Cacapon when uh, we had a place that was probably that more than three miles from wherever yours was. <laughs> <laughs> Small uh, world. Yeah. And I would, you know, I would spend the most intense week working at the Center for Law and Social Policy, and my kids and I would go out and get our canoes on that river, and the whole world fell away. Indeed, indeed. And, it was, and I would come back nourished. Those little vac mini vacations. And I noticed uh, that you, sh you would set up, what, for lack of a better phrase, I'll call it meditation rooms. Well, they were meditation rooms. 
and you and and you would bring the client. How did the clients react uh, to this when you enlisted them in the meditation? Well, this was after my. I wasn't practicing law anymore at that point. I was at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, okay, okay. where I was uh, uh, the first president, and uh, there I realized med my own meditation practice. Just half an hour in the morning uh, was something when I was dean of the law school that was extremely helpful to me and helped me to function more effectively as a law school dean in a difficult situation. When I came to the foundation, I realized that this was not, that this practice of meditation of quiet, stillness, settling the mind, wasn't just something that could be helpful to me. This was something that could, could affect all of our programs if we were going to be making grants to people, say, in the environment field, we could make an introduction to meditation practice something that was helpful to them. We could make that part of our world. And of course, we could make it part of our uh, own community in this foundation where we had a dozen employees. So we had a meditation room. And each day at 3 o'clock, people who, uh, who, were, who wanted to meditate would come together. And we'd sit together quietly. Sometimes if, if one of the great meditation teachers whom we knew or were supporting came in, they'd come in and lead a meditation. And when other people were coming into the foundation with their proposals, uh, trying to get our support, we'd invite them to come into our meditation process. And gradually it became something that really um, affected the way we did our business in the foundation. And I think we were a better foundation by virtue of the fact that we brought meditation explicitly into our work. You know, uh, I, I, w I read uh, about a number of the things that the uh, Cummings Foundation did. And the one that resonated the most with me, quite frankly, uh, was bringing the ideas about meditation or stillness or whatever it was to the medical profession. And I'd like you to explain that. And also, I'd like you to explain something which I believe you mentioned in the book, and if, even if you didn't, I'll mention it which is that the, me the scientists are now finding a neurobiological reason why this is true. This is not just Eastern philosophy. This is neurobiological. Bill Moyers came to us uh, probably 15 years ago uh, with the idea, which later became a television series and a best-selling book called Healing and the Mind. It was a real turning point in the way people thought about the mind-body relationship in the context of health. And um, he, the, uh, you know, at the time he put this series together, uh, Moyers was a real pioneer, and there was virtually no medical school in the country that was teaching alternative medicines, alternative medicine generally, uh, and meditation in particular. And he, with, with his usual brilliant reporting, pulled together the stories of how alternative medicine was really uh, uh, changing the landscape below, below the horizon at the time he did the series. But uh, he encouraged us to support this series he did. And we were supporting doctors and healing centers that were carrying this work forward. Perhaps the most prominent one who was featured on the Moya series was a man named John Cabot Zinn, who uh, was at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center and introduced something which he called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And that was a kind of a meditative skill. He was teaching people who were suffering from chronic pain how to use meditation and other mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques to deal with their pain and to manage it and how people who are suffering from cardiac disease could reduce their risk by regularly practicing meditation. Moyers analyzed Kabat-Zinn's work. Kabat-Zinn's work in subsequent years has become uh, uh, a widely practiced uh, part of medical training and what goes on in hospitals across the country. Uh, to deal with the stress of illness, stress uh, related to cardiac disease, and other areas where it arises. Interestingly, while this has been going forward 
the kind of scientific evidence which you uh, mentioned has also been developed. Uh, there's been the most extraordinary use of the most sophisticated kind of uh, brain scan technology to show how meditation works on the mind. It's not just uh, a, a kind of an Eastern practice which makes people feel better. What um, uh, magnetic resonance uh, MRI imaging, yeah. imaging has shown is that uh, meditation actually changes the function and the structure of the brain physiologically. The structures of the brain appear different for people who have been meditating and people who haven't. So the skeptics who just said, well, this is a kind of an Eastern fad, are now starting to recognize that there's something really important yeah. here. Yeah. The possibilities here in the medical field we've talked about, also people are starting to think about including periods of meditative training for small children, particularly with r in connection with attention deficit disorder. Because here, meditation is a way of training attention. Yeah, yeah. And for children who have been um, spent too much time in front of television sets, they need a retraining to help them to focus and to be attentive over a period of time. And that's the possibility that yeah. that early work suggests yeah. Yeah. going forward. Yeah might be d simpler to destroy all the television sets and also a good <laughs> idea. Um, you know, this neurobiological stuff has a lot of possible uh, impacts. I think it's going to change. It's already in the process of changing uh, economics because it shows that a lot of the uh, basic assumptions of, or some of the most important basic assumptions of e economics are incorrect. They can tell that by scanning the brain and watching what's happening. We only have about a minute and a half. And uh, we have neglected one of the uh, very seriously important things that you did, uh, and that is starting the uh, CUNY Law School. Why don't you talk a little bit about what the CUNY Law School was all about, what the politics were all about, what the administrative hassles were all about, and uh, why the CUNY Law School was for its time a, a revolution, as it were. The CUNY Law School was, uh, came into business with a commitment to train lawyers as whole people. This was revolutionary. We wanted to look at all the different tasks that lawyers have to perform, from careful analysis of complicated statutes to reassuring uh, immigrants uh, that they have an opportunity to uh, have their uh, immigrant status resolved in a just way. So this is a, this is a very complicated set of tasks and that lawyers have. Law had. isn't all high-level analytical thinking of the type you were taught at Yale or at home. No, it, it was not. It, it, you know. If, if you're talking about family law, if you can help a family in distress work out the tensions between husband and wife, children and parents, those are on the edge of law and psychology and simply compassion. And for a lawyer to be able to dip into the compassion and the psychology and the law, then you have a person who's really going to be effective in serving a family that's in distress. So that was the kind of law school we wanted to build. We brought in senior faculty that had experience in public interest law, and we brought in a student body that had real-world experience. So they were bringing in their life experience into the study of law. And it was a very exciting place to be, and I'm happy to say that now, 25 years after we began, some of the innovations we started with are finding their way into the yeah. legal educational mainstream. Uh, you know, Charlie, I wish we had more time because there was so much that happened at CUNY, all the opposition you faced, <coughs> uh, even from the students. <laughs> well, anyway, it, it's, uh, to some, we started art school five years afterwards, so, uh, but you had blazed the trail originally. We, of course, when we started, we knew you fellows existed. But we're out of time, so let me thank you for coming. And I hope Pleasure, you have a, Larry. Thank you. I, I hope you have a safe trip back to California tomorrow morning. Thank you for being here. And to the audience, thank you. Be with us again next time.